Well, good morning, church. I'm so glad you joined us today. The times are, are tough. We are, are separated. We're not able to have the freedoms we're used to. But today, we're going to put all that aside. We're going to worship a God who loves us, worship a Savior who died for us. As we, we kind of spring forward from Easter, we're going to, to recognize God for who he is, how he's in control, and we're going to worship together. So I'm going to pray, and then we're going to begin by singing Saved My Soul by City of Light. So let's pray. Jesus, I thank you that we can gather here this morning, that even though we have distance around that's keeping us apart, Lord, we, we pray that you would have us be of one mind and one spirit as we worship this morning, as we sing praises. And Lord, may, may you be honored and glorified today. May our hearts be open to receive from you, from the teaching, and from what you want to speak to us. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's join together in song. Save my soul I am yours forevermore I won't be moved of this I'm sure You are my God and you save my soul By the enemy, but you broke them in victory. Now I'm free, I am free. You're my joy, and you are my hope. I am saved by your grace alone. I will sing of your love for me. I am free, I am free. You, my God, have saved my soul. Save us. 
Lord, I, I pray that each person watching this morning would be able to sing that song with truth and honesty. And Lord, for those who can't, may you work in their lives. May you open them up to hear from you so that they can sing that you saved their soul. Lord, we thank you for what you've done. Lord, we praise you for how holy and wonderful you are. Amen. We're going to continue to sing a song, another song by City of Light called Once for All and how Jesus paid the price once and all for our sin. Let's sing together.
But Jesus truly paid for the price of our sin once and for all. And I, It's been a wonderful celebration over the last week of what Jesus has done. And we remembered his death and resurrection. And today we are going to have a few announcements. I just want to encourage everyone, if you would like to give to the church your tithes and offering, you can give to the number below. Well, uh, we aren't able to meet in person. You can give online to the bank. If that's not an option for you, please contact me and I can get you in contact with another way to give. But if you're able to do online banking, that's the best way to do it. We're going to pray for this offering that God would use it. Lord Father, we thank you for blessing us. We thank you that we, we can give back a small portion of what we have. Lord, we ask that you would use it even in the midst of, of lockdown, of being separated, to further your kingdom. Lord, may, may you be glorified in our giving. Lord, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I just want to remind everybody, in May we will be starting a new series we're going to be following a series called Jesus Game Changer, and it's going to be a six-week series, and we'll start on the, the 3rd of May. As part of that, we will also be having a weekly Bible study, and so I would encourage you to make sure you get Zoom, make sure you know how to work it, so that way it works for us whenever we start the Bible study. Um, if any of you are in need, are in um, need of any assistance, please contact me. There's um, quite a number of people in the congregation who are willing to help out in any way possible, you know, using social distancing and making sure we, um, yeah, stay stay in a, a healthy or minister in a healthy way. So contact me if you have any questions or, or need anything, and we'll make sure that as a body we come together and help each other as we need it. Um, we're now going to watch a video about Jesus Game Changer, so just a little, little trailer about that so you can begin to think about it. Let's watch the video together. The spread of Christianity across the centuries is a remarkable story. From a backwater in the Roman Empire to become a truly global faith. It transcends cultures, social classes, language and ethnic groups. The question we should ask is, what did the people who are most close to Jesus do after his ascension to the Father? And the answer is, they went on mission. Go and preach the gospel. Make disciples. But what compelled ordinary people to face difficulty, danger, and even death to take the message of Jesus to the ends of the earth? Is this idea of going where the gospel is not yet. I was living in darkness, and Jesus bright light to my light. The ends of the earth is, is Jesus' way of saying no one is exempt. When you know that Jesus loves you and your sins are forgiven, he can't help but share it. Jesus the Game Changer to the ends of the earth follows the movement of Christianity around the world, telling some of the great stories of vision, faith and sacrifice. Our plea for the church in the West is never to give up this faith that we are dying for in Africa. It will take some cost. Are we really bringing the whole gospel in a way that is salty and light bearing. You know, Christianity, in the face of persecution and opposition, has actually taken this message to the ends of the earth. As people have talked about the life and teaching of Jesus, it's become a global game changer. Difference is dissolved. Christ has come for the whole of humanity. The true missionary activity is, is not to find people who've never heard of Christ, but to go to the places where people have known and forgotten. Now, it's our time. I'm looking forward to this series and I know it's going to be a blessing as well as a challenge 
to see God preached around the world, see how he has been preached and how, how the message of Jesus spread, and also challenge us to continue to, to spread the gospel message to a world that needs it. And it'll be extra difficult now thinking of ways to do it in the current climate, but I know that God is in control and his word will be preached and we as his church will be the ones that he uses to spread the gospel message. So be prepared to be challenged by this series. I'm now going to come to a prayer, a time of prayer, and Amanda is going to lead us in prayer. So Amanda, let's pray. Hi church family, and a hearty welcome to anyone who's joining us online today. My name's Amanda and I'll be praying with you. Actually, I'll be reading your prayer because I'm not pro at being on screen. So bear with me and we'll see how we go. Let's bow our heads. Loving Father, thank you that you are the Lord of our world. We are feeling a little overwhelmed at the moment with all the debacle over COVID-19. The world as we know it has changed in a few short weeks. We are finding it difficult to come to terms with events on a daily basis. The one constant though is you, Lord. Nothing surprises you and you are in control of the whole situation. Your grace and love help us feel secure in the midst of everything. We are to keep our eyes upwards. We can turn everything over to you, Lord. You will carry the burden for us. We know that we are not immune to tragedy and troubles just because we believe in you, Lord, but you promise never to forsake us. We pray for those who have died during this horror. We pray for their grieving relatives and loved ones who are struggling to understand. We pray for the frontline workers who are doing their utmost to contain the spread. We pray for each other as we try to do the right thing and do our bit to limit the boundaries of this virus. We pray for government, both here in Australia and overseas, as they try to work out the way forward. We pray for everyone who has lost a job, business or livelihood, that they will be okay and find ways to keep life and limb together. We thank you for support networks who can step up and give us a helping hand where needed. We thank you that we have a church family who might fill a need, spoken or unspoken. We thank you that we can still find ways to keep in touch while staying apart from our families and loved ones. We thank you, Lord, that you give us, you love us despite everything. Lord, we also know that not everything is about the dreaded virus. Life continues around us and goes on as it always has. Babies are born, people are celebrating birthdays, there are weddings, promotions, graduations and lives to be lived. Most of all, you are gathering people to you as you have always done. You're working in ways that are invisible to us unless we are looking in the right direction. Keep us focused on the right direction. Keep us faithful and looking in adoration towards you. Help us to remember the important things in life. Help us to set our priorities, to love each other, look out for each other, and be grateful that you are our Father. Help us remember that we, are, we have received your precious grace and that is enough to sustain us through every trial and tribulation. We pray all these things in your name. Amen. Well, thank you, Amanda, for that prayer. Let's uh, begin by opening God's Word. We're going to be looking at John chapter 21. So if you want to, to open your Bible or open the little Bible, uh, uh, Bible that's on the side of the screen there, and you can do that to John chapter 21. We're going to be looking at the first 19 verses. But I don't know about you, the last um, six weeks have been very strange. For some of us, it's meant extra work. Where we, we figure out how to do work in the midst of lockdowns, in the midst of having social distancing, and it's been a challenge, a very busy time. For others, it's been a very quiet time, a time where you've been stuck at home, not been able to do much, and it's been, yeah, just very different. And I don't know about you, but that feeling of life being on hold, that idea that we don't know how long this is going to last, it's supposed to be a temporary thing, at some stage you'll be able to go back to doing whatever it was we were doing before, but for now it's just like this holding pattern. And for me, as I, I've read this passage today in John 21, I feel that there are similarities with that with the disciples. To give you a bit of background, so this is after Easter, so you have the, we did, looked at 
the Palm Sunday where Jesus entered to Jerusalem and the disciples would have been excited. Jesus rode in on a donkey. People were putting palm branches down. They were worshiping him. It was really a king's entrance into Jerusalem. Just five days later, they're calling for Jesus to be crucified. Disciples who were excited, thinking that maybe this is time where Jesus is going to, to take his throne, are, are shocked and, and they're, um, they've run away. They're scared. They don't know what's going to happen. And Jesus is crucified. Then Jesus rises from the grave on Easter morning. And we see that Jesus has appeared to them. And as we, we're going to read here, this is going to be the, the third time Jesus appears to the disciples as a whole. Um, according to John's Gospel, he did see other people one-on-one -on -one or one in pairs. But uh, this is the, the third time. But the disciples get message. They see Jesus a few times. So there's a bit of excitement, but unknown what's going to happen. And he, he, they are told to go to Galilee. So they've traveled from Jerusalem where the crucifixion happened. They've gone to Jerusalem. They've um, gotten there, and then they're just waiting. They don't, they're waiting. Jesus told them to go. What's going to happen? They don't know. And so Peter, he gets his well, six other of the disciples. He gets a crew, and they decide to go fishing. That got me thinking. I've, I've looked at this passage before, and I, I've I thought of it as that Simon Peter, they were going back to something that was familiar. They were fishermen. And, you know, a lot of times when we are uncertain about things, we, we go back to the, the familiar. We go back to our comforts. And during this time where we're at home, where we're perhaps worried, we don't know, there's perhaps comforts that we have. Um, some good, some bad, some you know, maybe you're exercising more, making sure you're you can now go in for more walks than what you normally would. So that's a positive thing for some of us, myself included. We're probably um, binge eating a little too much. Uh, we're eating comfort from food, and that's not a, a positive thing. But there's there's things that we have in our lives that we go back to. There are, are comfortable comfortable things, whether it's reading, TV. We we kind of escape into things when when times are tough or when things are slow like they are now. And for the disciples, it was no different. They were told to go to Galilee. They're, they get there. What do they do? Well, they're waiting. Well, let's go fishing. So we're going to pick up in John chapter 21 now. We're going to... Um, be reading the first um, number of verses. So John chapter 21, verse 1. Afterwards, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. And they said, We'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat. But that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize it was Jesus. He called out to them, Friends, have you any fish? No, they answered. He said, Throw your net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. When they did this, they were unable to haul this net in, because of the large number of fish. The disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, It is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards, a hundred meters. Um, then they landed, sorry, when they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals, where the fish, um, there were fish on it and some bread. So as we, we look at this first section, they've, they've gone out fishing and they have caught nothing. And I, I love to fish. I also love to catch things. But on multiple occasions, I've gone out fishing and I've caught nothing. And there's, uh, they get some enjoyment out of it, but it's, it's nice to catch fish. But they've, they've caught nothing all night. And there's another time in the Bible where they have done this. This is right before Jesus called Peter. They went out, they went fishing, and they caught nothing. 
Jesus, just like he did this morning, he asked them to throw the net on the other side of the boat. And when they did that, a large, um, uh, a large catch of fish was caught by the disciples. Immediately, although they weren't able to recognize him from the shore, they recognized because of what he had done. What, this was the second time Jesus had done that. They said, this must be Jesus. And Peter, never one to be held back, he puts his cloak, gets his clothes, he jumps in the water, and he swims to shore to get there as soon as possible. And they come, and they, they find Jesus there on the shore. He's already sitting there, he has a fire going, he already has fish being cooked for them, and he is there before them. And they are um, in amazement, and they are wondering about him. And we're going to finish up the, the, reading the story in verse 10. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish you have just caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, about 153. But even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, Come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, Who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread, and gave it to them, and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus made the disciple made the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. So they they know who he is. They're not speaking. They're they're waiting for him to do something. They're they're in that waiting pattern. <coughs> They don't know what their future holds. They, they had been spent three and a half years studying, um, learning from Jesus. And they, right when they thought the, that whatever they were training for, getting ready for, had come, he was coming into Jerusalem as a king, they crucified him. Things weren't going according to plan. Now Jesus had, was resurrected, but he wasn't with them all the time. He's given them instruction to wait in Galilee. And now they're here waiting for Jesus. And for Simon Peter, it would have been a, a difficult time. He knew what he had done. He knew that on the day Jesus or the night Jesus was arrested, that he denied Jesus three times throughout that nighttime before the morning crow crowed. He knew what he had done. He had boasted that oh, although all the rest may Run away. I will never desert you. Not I. But yet he was the one who denied Jesus. And Jesus decides to address Peter about this. He goes to Peter. While they're, while they're sitting there, the seven of them with Jesus. And Jesus begins to talk to Simon Peter. So let's look at verse 15 to 19. When Simon had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, Son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, Do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, Feed my sheep. Very truly I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your arms, and someone else will dress you and lead you to where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, Follow me. Here we have Peter. We have Peter who just finished a week before denying Jesus. He's denied him, and yet he has now still following Jesus' instruction, goes to Galilee, and Jesus is addressing him directly. And three times he asks Peter, Do you love me? First time he says, Feed my lambs. The idea that he is to 
um, share the gospel with people who are new in their faith, was to preach an evangelistic message where people are going to come to know him and raise them up as lambs. The second time, he says, take care of my sheep. The, the word there is shepherd, to shepherd my sheep. He was going to be um, a, a pastor of the people, a leader of the church, and he was going to take care of the sheep. And then the third time, do you love me? And Peter said, you know all things, and you know that I love you. And he said, feed my sheep. So he's going to feed the lambs, he's going to take care of the sheep, and he's also going to feed the sheep. These are three things that God has told Peter what to do, that he is going to use Peter to be a leader in the church, to share the message, to, to feed people, not with, not with food, but with the message of Jesus, with the teachings of Jesus. Peter was going to feed them spiritual food so that they could grow, so that the church could grow, so that it would be spread, the gospel message, to people who needed to hear all this time, Peter is, it was in a holding pattern when this came. G Peter was, was waiting in Galilee. He was going back to what was familiar. He was fishing. He was a fisherman. That's what he did. But at the very beginning, when Jesus called him, he said the same thing. He said, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And again, he ends this section here by saying, follow me. Peter, follow me. In the same way, that is what he is asks of us. When we put our faith and trust in him, he's asking us to follow him. To do the things he wants us to do. To live our lives for him. With him directing us. We are to follow him. He is our, our leader, our king. The one we are, are to put our, our faith and trust in. We are in the, the midst of a, a hold and wait pattern. We are trying to, to get along with our lives as best we can. We're stuck at home a lot. We're not able to see the, the people that we love and care for. We're in a bit of a holding pattern, similar to what the disciples are at this time. And they're going to continue to be on a holding pattern until the day when Jesus sends his spirit the day of Pentecost. But that time, these times of waiting, doesn't have to be wasted. And the next week, we want to look a bit about what can we be doing in this time? How can we uh, have value in our time during the, the COVID-19 virus time? But God has work for us. He's preparing us. He's getting us ready. And even now, in this bit of a quiet time, what is he telling us that we can do? Perhaps like Peter, you're, you're not sure where you are with God. You've done some things, you believe in him, but you've done some things that you, that you regret and you need to get right with him. And he, just like he welcomed Peter back and he, he gave him a, a job, a purpose to feed his lambs, to shepherd his, his sheep, to feed his sheep. He calls us back in when we disappoint, when we do the wrong thing, when we let sin creep in, when we, we don't give him the kingship of our lives. He is standing there ready to welcome us back when we humbly come back to him. If you notice here, Peter was not the same person he was before. Oh Lord, if all these other people I reject you, I will never leave you. I'll never leave your side. And those same words that he spoke came out of a pride, came out of him thinking that he was better than he was. But when push came to shove, he fled, he ran. And he denied that he knew Jesus. And Jesus here welcomes him back. But here that, that pride is gone. He's humble saying, Lord, you know, you know me. You know that I love you. He is much more humble. That, that experience that he went through broke him and put him in a place where he was ready to, 
to rely on God and not his own, I'm going to do this, Jesus, regardless of whatever you're going to say. It humbled him. It made him ready to be a better leader, I believe. And sometimes we go through difficult experiences. And they're, they're experiences that are going to mold and shape us. I wish in life I didn't have to go through difficult experiences. I wish it was all easy. But if I didn't go through those difficult times, this COVID-19 time could be a, is a difficult time. But what are we going to be like on the other side? What is God using that in our lives to mold and shape us? What is God using this for the church as a whole to mold us and shape us and prepare us to continue to be the church, to share the message of Jesus? When we look at the disciples, this ragtag you know, uneducated, tradesman-type people. There's nothing wrong with those uneducated tradesman people, but Jesus used these people to change the world, to spread the message, not because they were amazing, but because the message had power. The message of Jesus has power. So what are we doing now? What is God preparing us for now? You know, Perhaps you're one of the people who have a lot more time right now. How are you preparing yourself to, be, to grow in your walk with Christ? Preparing yourself to, to be His hands and feet in this time. Perhaps you're more busy than ever. What is God working in your life to, to mold and shape you? To make you more like Him? How can we want and desire to be in His presence, desire to love Him and live for Him more. The disciples, I think in some ways they needed this time to prepare. They needed this time of waiting. When Jesus left, when He um, went up into heaven. You know, he told them to wait and pray. The, the, the disciples were praying and waiting on the Lord. I've been um, really thankful for the number of people I've talked to over the last couple of weeks that said, oh, I have so much more time to pray. What a wonderful thing for the church to be doing, to spending, be spending more time in prayer. Praying that God would be preached, praying that people would come to know him, praying that this virus would stop, but that the people would give glory to God and not in man at it being stopped, as finding a cure if, if, we, if and when we do. This can be a, a time where we turn people back to the Lord. Are we praying for revival? Could this be something that brings revival to people, brings people back to the Lord? It's going to start with the church. It's going to start with prayer. It's going to start with God's people praying, seeking Him, living for Him, and preaching the message. And God's going to do the rest. So this period here, maybe it's a time of waiting. Maybe it's a time where it feels like where time has stopped. But that's not the case. There's so much more happening right now than was us just waiting around until we can go back to what we want. I, for one, I don't want to go back to normal. I want this time to be a time where I am changed, where I'm waiting on the Lord, where I'm listening to Him, where I'm experiencing Him. I don't want to be just go back to the norm. The disciples, they, yes, they're fishing here, but whenever again do we hear of the disciples fishing? Not, not for, for physical fish that swim in the ocean, swim in the lakes and rivers, but they became fishers of men. They went out and they spread the gospel message. So is God preparing us like he's prepared the disciples, like he's challenged Peter? Just like he's challenged Peter here, we as a church, we are challenged with the message of Jesus to go out. And as we look 
um, in the weeks to come through at Jesus the Game Changer. It's going to challenge us to share this message of Jesus and see how it circumnavigated the, the world, how it spread, and the cost it took to spread that gospel. Here, where he talks about Peter, he, he shares with Peter. He tells him, you know, lead the church, feed my sheep, feed the lambs. He's told him that. He's also telling him here that he's going to die on a cross. He's going to be arms outstretched. He's, someone's going to dress him. He's going to go where he doesn't want to go. He's telling Peter, you're going to die for me. As a result of this, you will die on the cross. And we know Peter's response. He stood up on the day of Pentecost and he preached. And he led the early church. Not on his own, but with, a, with help of many others. But he was used by God. How are you going to be challenged and shaped during this time so that you can be used by God now and in the future? The future is going to look different. We don't know what it's going to look like. But God is in control. He wants to use you. He wants to use me. Are we ready? Are you ready to be used by God? Do we need to be humbled like Peter? Are there things that pride gets in our way? Can we humbly come before God, allow him to mold us and shape us, and then go out and live for him regardless of the cost? That's what Peter did. That's what the early disciples did. They lived a life for Jesus. We're going to close in prayer. Father, these disciples, they, they were in a bit of a waiting pattern here. They'd seen you after you rose from the grave, after the resurrection, and they've gotten a little bit of instruction, but they're just waiting. Like, much like we are, we're just kind of waiting. Things are happening, but all of us, myself included, we're looking towards what's going to happen when this is all finished. When can we go back to seeing others? When can we meet as a church again? But our, our hopeful future isn't always what happens. The disciples, they... Despite the fact that you warned them and you shared with them what was going to happen, they were in shock. They fled. They were scared. They were unsure of what was happening. They went back to fishing while they were waiting. Lord, I, I pray that we would be challenged during this time to not just be looking forward to when things go back to normal, but that we would be changed, that you would change us, you would grow us to be more like you, that we'd be more surrendered to you. Lord, I pray for anyone who's listening who doesn't know you as their Lord and Savior. They've never um, asked you for forgiveness, recognized that you took their sin on the cross, their punishment for their sin. Lord, may today the day they recognize that. They believe in you and what you've done for them. And they put their faith and trust in you. Lord, change us. Use this time not as a waiting time, but as a training time, a growth time. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to now sing, um, Be Thou My Vision. So let's sing together.
about this week, will you be challenged to not just be waiting, not just be looking for what's next, but let God use this time, use what's happening right now to, to put in you more love for Him, put in you a more desire to obey Him, put in you a more desire to serve and live for Him. May we answer that call that He called here to Peter. May we follow Him in all that we do. Have a great week, and please let me know. Call me if, if you need anything, but have a great week, and draw close to the Lord this week. Be challenged to, to get closer to Him. Have a great week. See you later.